was a real connection in the neighborhood that unfortunately you guys don't have a clue about. There's no shine, no cloud on you guys. It's just that they broke it up before you could experience it. Not only were blacks migrate to Flint for those factory jobs, a lot of white people were migrating as well from the southern states. The people, it was so overwhelming, people were coming into the area so quickly and so fast that General Motors, along with the city commission, decided to start building homes for these people. As General Motors expanded, more and more people poured into, uh, into Flint, and there were only two places that where black folks could live. It was that St. John Street expanded between Saginaw Street and the river. Mm -hmm. we, couldn't go, we couldn't go west of Saginaw Street. We couldn't live there. We couldn't go east of the river. Right. We couldn't live there. Right. Um, so we were sandwiched into those, that odd cave uh, uh, between those two boundaries. When they started the foundry and the manufacturing, it is told that they built three tents for blacks to live in, one tent to live in, one tent to go to church in, and another tent to play in, shoot crap and buck dance and all that kind of stuff. So the city being segregated forced us to a certain area. It was so overwhelming, people were coming into the area so quickly and so fast that General Motors, along with the city commission, decided to start building homes for these people, for everybody but the Blacks. Civic Park, Oak Park, Mount, uh, Mott Park, Manly Village, all those communities were built to house General Motors employees were coming into Flint so rapidly. But Black people could not get buy into those homes. The banks wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't mortgage them for one thing. City Commission would not allow it. General Motors would not allow it. Like I said, General Motors was really powerful in the plant as far as the government was concerned. So that's how we ended up in the St. John community. It was just the biggest happening this side of it. I mean, people was coming from out of town, from everywhere. By us being clustered together, segregated together, it forced us to unite. And that's how we became a strong community. And our black leaders, plus our black pastors, came out of the, out of the foundry of working for Buick or Chevrolet plant. And they were members of unions. They learned how to caucus. They learned how to negotiate. Uh, our first mayor, Floyd McCree, they came out of the shop. Reverend Porter came out of the foundry. His first job in, in Michigan was working in the foundry. We were a black mecca. Because basically everything on St. John Street was owned by blacks except uh, Joe Hemahaw's market, the St. John market was owned by the Salem's. Uh, Pap's Drug Store was owned by Mr. Pap. I don't know what he was, if he was Jewish or what. And then Balkan Bakery was owned by the Germans. Um, then you had Saul's Market. We have everything that we need within ourselves. And, and I think we've just got to understand that we have it, number one, and, and then to, to use it. You know, we don't have to be stagnant. We don't have to be, uh, you know, at the bottom of, of the wrong. I mean, we, we have it within ourselves to, to do for ourselves and to lift ourselves up. See? So you collectively learn how to uh, work together. We knew who was in the community. They've done that all over America, where we, uh, where black people were concentrated, whether it be Philadelphia, whether it be Chicago, whether it be, uh, you name it, uh, 
The people talk about Black Wall Street, they made that possible in 1921, but Rosewood, there's a lot of areas that they would, Charles hit the word diffuse it, it you know, suppress it, hold it back. That's why we had St. John, Oak Park, and all, that, that was us. But not cross Saginaw. You know, uh, yeah, you went over there to clean somebody's house or something. Welch was all the um, house cleaner. That's all they did because they the black people went in them houses. Miller Road. The help went to work every day. As Tulsa, as Black Wall Street got bombed, you know, in reality with planes and real bombs, etc. That was our bomb. You know, that's what that, along with urban renewal, replaced uh, or displaced all of the uh, residents of the St. John Street area. So, yeah, it was definitely a bomb. Uh, it was about 475 and about urban renewal. That's the moniker they put on it, but actually, what it was was uh, urban removal. That's it. The whole idea that's was to get take all that land that was there, that black people were living in, get rid of all those homes and get rid of those black people and build an industrial park as to what they just did. You know, the fact that, um, you know, in vacating or abandoning the city of Flint, uh, it just devastated, you know, the quality of life uh, throughout our community. It was sort of seared, you know, through the soul of the city. You know, it's not as vibrant as, uh, as it was uh, in the heyday. Uh, as Fred was saying earlier, um, you know, the city of Flint had one of the highest per capita incomes in the entire country. Uh, now we have probably, uh, I think there was a a survey that came out a few years ago that we were probably at the bottom of the scale now. My father and my mother, they separated. And I was separated from my siblings. Therefore, my grandparents raised me. And um, we lived at 1112 Dakota, and that's where we stayed until Urban Renewal came. Urban Renewal was backed by most of the people in the St. John Street community because they misunderstood what was being told to them. They played, they played games with the words. Uh, the concept was that we're going to go in, we're going to redevelop the community. We're going to build some more houses. We're going to clean up the area. That's what we thought. That's what our parents thought and our grandparents thought or whoever. But the whole initial idea was to wipe out that community and make an industrial park as to what it is now for the GM suppliers. And that's what stands right now. Now, the problem with that was they were gonna move all these black people out. Um, what was it, 13, 1,300 families or something like that. But they didn't have any place for them to go. Where they didn't have any place they wanted them to go. What really makes me mad is that they took, and the Buick brought all in, they put the expressway through, they were paying people cash money for their houses. Now they were supposed to have what you call urban renewal, uh -huh. but they didn't do nothing. They should have set the people down and spaced them all over the city, you know, but they didn't do that. What they did was, they gave those people that cash money, and over in the Northwestern high school area, see most of your last two high schools were built outside the city but they annexed them in for taxes, okay? So what they did is up there on Cranwood Drive, and that area right up there by Northwestern High School, Sally Court and all that area up there, solid white. My superintendent built a school up there on the engine plant, from the engine plant. But what happened was the real estate people got a hold to it and they say, well, look, we can get you twice what you pay for your house. We got some people we can sell it. So they wanted to make a profit. So they sold it to a black, and then they told the told the white folks the property is going to devaluate the blacks started coming in. So what they did in 10 years, that turns, in 10 years of solid black, that whole area, solid black, because St. John Street said, well, so-and-so moved over, he was my neighbor on St. John, I'm moving over on that area. Uh, urban renewal was coming, so people, they were 
getting themselves, you know, ready to to move out because they kept telling them for years. What, started the in 60, 60, yeah. 60, 61, they started yeah. that talk. And for years, they, our, my, our parents, our grandparents didn't do anything with their homes because they were waiting for the Buick and Urban Renewal to buy out their houses. We had rumors, 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 and everybody in that house got $2,500 to put towards another house somewhere. And that how I hug, because I think that's how I, my parents put me down as a renter in order for me to get the money to put down on a HUD house in another neighborhood. Fortunately, I ended up in a decent neighborhood, but a lot of people didn't, but that's how we all got scattered. It was bittersweet. I, I yeah. shouldn't say bittersweet, maybe. I don't know if that's the word for it, because my grandparents, they couldn't handle it. My grandmother had a stroke. She couldn't handle it. And there were others um, in the neighborhood they wonder where, where are they going to go? That's when the deterioration of the St. John Street area started because people finally realized, hey, my house is not worth anything. I'm not going to, why put any more money in and they're not going to pay me for it? So when you hear about St. John Street being deteriorated and ghetto and dirty and everything, this was in the mid 60s to the 70s not in the 40s and the 50s, where most of us grew up, because it was nice and it was beautiful. We took care of our homes and everything else. And my dad and mother, they, find, they moved out in 62, to went across North Saginaw, Taylor Street, right near Northern High School. That's when they finally had to start opening up. And some of the real estate companies like Andy Anderson and all of them started fighting to move black families and get them in these areas. We even had a lot of people that were gathering uh, assistance from white people, going and getting the loan and then selling it back to the black person. Somehow they got everybody, you know, there was this housing thing and there was a, this one black couple that wanted to buy a house in Grand Blanc even, and they couldn't. But then they had a friend, uh, I think it was Bob Emerson, or, I've forgotten. I, and he and his wife bought the house and then sold it to them. And that's the way a lot of houses got, you know, the way we integrated a lot of neighborhoods. When Flint passed the open housing, yeah. uh, you know, uh, ordinance, you know, to open up the city citywide, you know, where black families could live anywhere in the city. You know, of course, before then, they had covenants in certain areas like, uh, like Civic Park, Mott Park. Uh, there, were, there were racial covenants and you couldn't live in those areas. And what the open housing uh, ordinance did was open up the entire city. Uh, the families that were displaced from St. John Street dispersed throughout the city. You know, some went west, uh, you know, the area up uh, near Northwestern High School, uh, that subdivision became very popular. Um, a lot of them went to Civic Park, uh, not many to Mott Park initially. Uh, but you know, we became scattered. We became a scattered people. It was emphasized that now, you know, if you want to live in a certain neighborhood or if you want to, you know, buy a certain thing, and if you have the money, fine. And if there were any, you know, and I'm sure there were a lot of whites that were, you know, objected to this, but they were very, you know, most of them were pretended, at least, <laughs> to be very cooperative and going along with the program. But those that did step out beyond their community and didn't go with the other blacks, they suffered the consequences they of had, it from, really. from the whites. They did, oh man, well, they it had was awful. All kind of it was problems. Awful. A lot of yeah. them were chased out of the, out yeah. of the area. You have no. written some people that have paid for their homes 
and they and they they were thinking that they're gonna live there for the rest of their lives and you uproot them and then you give them chump change where you can't buy a new house. They directed my grandmother back into another ghetto. Mm -hmm. I said, well, yeah. well, you know, what's up with that? No, I think that it just tore up. The St. John community was just, you know, urban renewal just erased it right off the map. And I think, that, and so, why didn't they take some of these other communities that, well, you know, were on their way, could not furnish the the interest? You know, people didn't want whatever they put there. People wouldn't go there, and so, but the places that were providing shelter for people, and. Those are the ones that, oh, we need this for urban renewal, and if you don't, you know, won't go peacefully, we'll find a way to take your, your land. You know, Flint used to be a very vibrant, beautiful, uh, productive city, and we're struggling to get back to that. We want to teach, get the message out to our young people about their ancestors their grandmothers and their grandfathers, what they did. The St. John Street and Industrial Street and Floral Park were all examples of how black people can get along together and look out for each other. Yep, and that gets to the crux of it. how, why St. John Street, Saint, the St. John Street neighborhood was destroyed by urban renewal and the uh, I-475 expressway. Mm -hmm. They destroyed our unity. Exactly. We have never been the same. We have never been unified since then. And if we don't get it together, we probably won't ever be again. I want kids and young people today to not get caught up in the trap that our parents and our grandparents got caught up in. Do the research. Be educated about, what you, about moving forward with things like that so we won't you won't wind up in the same situation that a lot of us have found ourselves in. You know, it didn't, it didn't kill us physically, you know, but it cut the soul out of what we had established uh, in the St. John Street neighborhood. Thank mm -hmm. you.